Well, good morning. Welcome back to Foundations in Faith as we continue to walk through those foundational teachings of what it means to be Christian, but also what it means to be Lutheran, walking through the Augsburg Confession, the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, the Large and the Small Catechisms. Today, uh, we dive into a rather large portion, actually, of the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. The fourth article talking about justification, which is the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. We'll actually define that next week, and we'll look at what Jesus did, and what justification is next week. But this week, I want to focus in on uh, an element that comes up very briefly, but is very important for a Lutheran mindset, especially as we walk through the scriptures. And this happens very, very shortly into the apology of the Augsburg Confession on this article. Now, the original Augsburg Confession on this article is about five lines. It talks about the centrality of Christ and the centrality of the work of Christ on the cross. And the reason that the apology is so much longer, it takes up 50 or 60 pages of writing, um, is that the, the idea of what Christ did on the cross is very, very different between Roman Catholics and Lutherans. And remember that the Lutherans were writing to the Roman Catholics at the time, so they draw this very clear and in-depth distinction against what the Roman Catholics believe and what the Lutherans believe. So I'm not going to walk through all 50 pages with you. That would take a really, really long time, and we don't have that amount of time. Um, but if you'd like to look at those, if you'd like to walk through those personally with me, please do reach out. I can send you those pages. We can walk through them in that way. But as we dig into the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, Melanchthon brings up right away what we call the law-gospel distinction. Now this works as kind of a bridge between what came before and what comes after within the Apology of the Augsburg Confession and the Augsburg Confession itself. So if you'll remember, before we've been talking about creation, we've been talking about God, and we've been talking about what went wrong with creation, namely sin. Our sin as human beings. We talked about original sin, how Adam sinned, and how that sin is passed down to you and me and to all human creatures today. Then Christ comes in. The cross comes in. We talked about last week the centrality of the cross, how everything revolves around the cross, and we view the rest of Scripture through the lens of the cross and the work of Christ on that cross. So as we look at Christ then, everything that comes afterward talks about this new life that we have in Jesus Christ. And this applies to the rest of the Augsburg Confession, the Apology of the Augsburg Confession as well. So right here, the fourth article really is kind of the turning point of the argument. It's the central argument of the Augsburg Confession. As we look at what came before, what set it right, and then how we live afterwards now that we are right with God. So basically we could say we walk from life before the cross to life after the cross. And that is this law-gospel distinction. So I just wanted to find those two terms for you, walk through those two terms, and kind of see how they play out just a little bit within Old Testament scripture. So the law speaks towards the will of God for human creatures. And we see this right off the bat within the garden. God gives a command to Adam and Eve. He gives two commands, actually. Be fruitful and multiply. Don't eat of the trees in the middle of the garden. Those two trees. These were the first laws. Pretty simple, um, but it's the will of God. What does it look like for you creatures, Adam and Eve, to function in relationship with your creator? Keep these two laws. Keep these two commands is another word we could use for laws. So we see that they break those commands. That relationship is broken between God and Adam and Eve and God and all of mankind. And as mankind then goes forth from the garden, more laws are given as God now has to define what it looks like to be a creature, what it looks like to have a relationship with him, what his good and perfect will is for creation. So as we look at the law, there are three uses that we make a distinction between within Lutheran theology. The first two of these actually function before a person comes to know Christ, before faith is worked in their hearts. The first function that we look at is called the, the curb, the curb of the law. And the easiest way to think about this function, uh, for me anyway, is to think of driving down the road. On the road side, on both sides, there are curbs. What is the function of that curb? Well, it's to define where you should go, kind of the boundaries that you should be between, and also to give you a warning. If you're, if you're bumping over and about to go off the road, that curb tells you, no, you got to get back into the middle of the road. And this is the, way, the first way that the law functions for us. It functions as a curb against sin and against evil. But as I said, this isn't just for Christians. This is for all people. All people are born with a type or an understanding, at least a little bit, of the law of God, of what it means to be a creature. We might call this natural law, but it's things that 
all of humanity generally agrees upon. Things like murder is bad, lying is bad, stealing is bad. Things that we just kind of know are wrong, whether we're Christian or not. You can talk to atheist friends, you can talk to friends of other religions, pretty much everyone's going to agree these are bad things that we shouldn't be doing. This is a function of the law. We might call it natural law. We, as Lutherans, we call it the curb function of the law. It keeps humanity within certain bounds. It curbs evil and sin away from us. It keeps us kind of walking at least within a certain will of God in that way. The second function then that we talk about is as a mirror. So when you think of a mirror, you wake up in the morning, you get out of bed, you go brush your teeth, you're looking in the mirror. What do you see? Of course, it's a reflection of yourself. If you're anything like me when you wake up in the morning, it's probably not the best reflection. Your hair's all kind of messed up, your eyes are tired, half open, whatever that looks like. But uh, that's how the law functions for us as well in its second use. It functions as a mirror in that we look into it and as we see this perfect will of God, what he would have for our lives, we see that we don't measure up to that will. And we see not only that we don't measure up to the will, but that we cannot measure up to that will on our own. We see our own sin staring back at us when we look into the law. And so we think of the law, we think of the Ten Commandments. Okay, you should have no other gods before me. That one's pretty well known. But how about honor your father and mother? Fourth commandment. Can anyone say they have always honored their father and mother at all times within their life? No. No, they can't. Can anyone say, I've never lied? I've never borne false testimony? Of course not. Everybody lies at some point in their life. So as we look at even just ten commandments, ten parts of the law of God, we can say we break every single one of these. And Jesus goes on in the Sermon of the Mount to actually show that in an even more stark manner. The one that says, uh, the commandment that says you shall not murder. I can say I've never murdered someone. I've never physically taken someone's life. But Jesus explains in the Sermon on the Mount, murder doesn't just mean taking someone's life. He says, if you've looked at your brother with anger in your heart, with evil intent in your heart, you've broken that commandment. You've murdered them in your heart. All of this is to show us that the law functions as a mirror. It shows us our sin. It shows us our complete helplessness to ever keep that law. And it drives us to a person, to God, to Jesus, who can fulfill that law for us. So it's at this point that we then look at, instead of the third use of the law, we look at the gospel. The gospel, another way to speak of gospel, is promises. These are the promises that God makes to his people, to his creatures. And these promises are all throughout the Old Testament. And maybe you've heard that the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are two different gods. The Old Testament God is wrathful and judgmental and punishment and, and can't stand sin. God of the New Testament is grace and mercy and welcomes everybody in. That's just plain not true. We believe God of the Old Testament and God of the New Testament is one being and is continuous. He has never changed in his dealings with people. It's just that we see different characteristics on display in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So there's a lot of gospel in the Old Testament if you're willing to look for it. I think immediately of the story of Jonah. If you're not familiar with that story, you're probably familiar with the outline of it, that Jonah goes to sea, he gets swallowed by a whale, he gets spit up on the land. And that's a good story. It's a good story to teach kids about miraculous preservation of God. But what that story is really about is Jonah is called to Nineveh. Now this was a city that was not Jewish. They were not a Jewish city. They didn't worship Yahweh. They weren't part of that line. And yet God calls Jonah to that city and delivers that city. He gives grace and mercy to the evil city of Nineveh that was outside of the concept of what uh, uh, Yahweh worship would be like, of who Yahweh would be concerned about. This is just one area in the Old Testament that shows, no, no, the God of the Old Testament is a God of grace, is a God of mercy, that even these people that don't know him, he gives them an opportunity, he forgives their sins, he calls them to himself, and he preserves them through sending a prophet to them. So all these promises in the Old Testament revolve around God's action for people, God stepping into their lives, God doing what they never could do on their own. God calling them back to himself, God redeeming them, God forgiving their sins. Think of all those great prophecies in Isaiah, I will remember their sins no more. You think of the suffering servant in Isaiah, as the servant takes on the sins of his people, as the transgressions of God's people are placed on the servant for the people's sake, for their forgiveness. All of these are promises, are gospel lessons and gospel truths within the Old Testament. 
the beautiful thing that we see within the Gospels, the beautiful thing that we see within Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all of the New Testament, is this truth from First or Second Corinthians one twenty, which says, let me pull it up just here a second, which says, for all the promises of God, all of that Gospel in the Old Testament, all those promises of forgiveness of sins, of redemption, of salvation, of God drawing people back to himself, all the promises of God find their yes in Christ. Another way of saying, find their fulfillment in Christ, are fulfilled in Christ. And that's why it's through him, through Jesus Christ, that we utter out our amen, our glory for God, our assent to his will for our lives. So we see a really quick uh, recap, a really quick review. The law shows us what it means to be people, what it means to be creatures living in the world that our creator has made shows us kind of what it means to be good and evil as we look at that natural law, as we look at that curve. It also shows us our sin. It shows us our need for our Savior. This is when the gospel comes in. We hear all those promises. Christ fulfills those promises for us on the cross. So what comes afterwards? As the gospel is fulfilled, as the gospel comes to life in our eyes and in our lives, as faith has worked in our hearts, the third use of the law then comes into play for us. Now, this is one that some people agree on, some people don't agree on. Most Lutherans agree on the third use of the law. Outside of Lutheran circles, you may hear some that do, you may hear some that don't. Um, But we put forward that, yes, there is a third use of the law, and that third use is as a guide. And when you think of a guide, what does a guide mean? I think of, I grew up in Colorado, I used to have a guide that would take us into the mountains sometimes. I'd go climbing or hiking with my dad. And if it was a long climb or a long hike, or even if we just got a book to function in that way, We needed a guide. We needed something to show us where to go, to show us where to stay, to show us what kind of routes we should take. That's one way that the law functions in the life of a Christian now. It functions as a guide. Because remember, the law is still God's good and perfect will for his creatures. That will doesn't change because Christ came on the scene. It's fulfilled that punishment for breaking God's will, for breaking his law, is given to Christ and his righteousness is given to us. But that law still remains. It's still God's good and perfect will for our lives. And so he tells us how, as Christians, as people now in relationship with God, we are to function. And we think of the Ten Commandments. Again, this is still God's good will for our lives. What does it mean to be a creature? What does it mean to be a Christian? Look at the Ten Commandments. And Jesus quotes the Ten Commandments. And Jesus actually simplifies this for us. As someone comes to Jesus and says, okay, you you have the law, you admit the law is given from God. What's the greatest law? What's the most important law that we should keep? Jesus says there's two. There's two most important laws. And in these two statements, he breaks down not only the Ten Commandments, but all of the laws within the Old Testament. He says the first one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Basically saying, love the Lord your God with everything that you are, everything that you have. This is the first commandment, what we might call the first table, commandments 1, 2, and 3. And they deal with how we, how we see God, how we view God, how we function in relationship with God. And the most important aspect of that is to keep God as God in our lives. Luther says our God is anything that we place our ultimate fear, love, and trust in. There are a lot of gods that are out there today. I think of money. If you put your ultimate fear, love, and trust in money, if your life revolves around money, about having that bank account, your security is wrapped up in your money, money has become your God. Maybe it's your reputation. Maybe you fear and love and trust in your reputation above everything else. So you're willing to do whatever it takes to keep that good reputation, to make sure other people like you, to make sure the business knows how important you are. If your reputation is the most important thing for you in your life, that has become your God. Jesus says, no, God the Father should be where you find your ultimate fear, your ultimate love, and your ultimate trust. That no matter what happens in the rest of the world, no matter what happens with the money, the bank account, with the job, with other relationships, no matter what happens, God is there. God is the one who defines you. God is the one who defines your life. And then the second commandment that Jesus says is the most important. It's like it. It's similar. As we keep God as the most important place in our lives, the second one then is to love our neighbor as ourselves, to place other people as more important than us. And then he goes on to explain who is our neighbor, what does our neighbor look like. It's not just the people that live next to you or across the street. Our neighbor is everybody. So basically the the two greatest commandments, all of the commandments of the Old Testament can be summarized in these two commandments, love God and love your neighbor. 
And that's what we endeavor to do as Christian life. And that's what the law shows us how to do as it functions as a guide within our lives. Um, it's good to take a, a short moment here and just talk briefly about the different laws that are in the Old Testament. Because I'll hear people say, well, okay, there's a law in the Old Testament that says men should never shave their heads and men should never shave their beards. I'm sitting here before you clean shaven, so obviously there must be a reason that I shaved my beard. Um, we break the laws in the Old Testament into three different categories, if you want to call them that. We break them into ceremonial laws, political laws, and moral laws. We would say the ceremonial and the political laws, those have been fulfilled or those have passed away. Those no longer apply to us. Things like how should people function in the tabernacle? How should people walk into the Holy of Holies? Um, how should people shave their heads or not shave their heads or grow their hair out or not grow their hair out? These were functions for ancient Israel for what it looked like to be faithful not only to God in that time but also to be different, to stand out from the people of that time that don't really apply to us anymore. They've, they've been fulfilled, they've passed away, uh, something of that nature. But the third that category then are the moral laws. These are the Ten Commandments. These are the things that instruct us how we can love God and how we can love our neighbor. And we would say those are still beneficial. Those are still God's will for our lives. So these are the laws that we talk about. These are the laws that we seek to fulfill and that we seek to continue to live by in our Christian walk. And that can be confusing as we dive into the Old Testament, as we look at different things. Do I still have to keep this? Do I not have to keep this? Well, what about food laws? And that's dealt with. Uh, if you look at the food laws of the Old Testament versus the food laws of the New Testament, how God lifts those restrictions. He gives that vision to Peter. And he says all food is clean. You can eat all food. Okay? So God does work and, and function and, and kind of change how these laws are applied throughout history. If you have questions about that, if you're reading the Old Testament, you see this law, say, well, do I need to follow this or not? Let's take a look at it. Reach out to me. Um, reach out to Pastor Steve. Reach out to Vic or something of that nature. Let's talk about it. Let's kind of work through these things. Um, but let's see how the law can function as a guide for our lives. So that was a really quick excursus, kind of diving into getting our toes wet of the area of justification. What was Jesus' work on the cross? Because as we look at the law, especially the first two functions of the law, we see those fulfilled again in the gospel. The promises of God find their yes in Jesus. The curb and the mirror are completed in Jesus because, again, as that mirror shows us our sin, we know we need someone to deal with that sin. That's where Jesus comes in. That's where the gospel comes in. And then after the cross, after Jesus comes into our lives, then the third function of the law shows us how to live as Christians, how to live as justified people of God. So next week we'll dive a little bit deeper into justification, into actually what was happening on the cross. Um, but before we get there, I do invite you to leave comments, leave questions below this YouTube. I'd love to interact with you in that way. You can also reach out to me via email, a Kubowitz or Pastor Andrew at S-T-P-A-U-L-B-O-C-A dot com. I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm happy to engage with you in that way. Until then, uh, I hope to see you next week. I hope you have a wonderful week. We're heading off to worship. It's Sunday morning. Uh, I'm going to go get things ready in the sanctuary. I hope you have a blessed week. and We'll see you later.